You work in the ER one day when a child presents with abdominal pain. And the mom says, you know what else? He's been peeing a lot and drinking tons of water. And come to think of it, he definitely does have this weird fruity smell. So you immediately think, hey, this is easy. I got my polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. Uh, this is DKA. I don't know what's up with this belly pain, but uh, I bet this guy's sugar is very high. At the same time, you get another patient in the room next door who's a bit older and you and is presenting obtunded and when they check the vital signs you notice there's a fever on your physical exam you hear some crackles in the lungs and so on your x-ray you see that she's got a pneumonia uh, in her lungs and so you check a sugar for her and it's just off the charts it won't even register on the meter so you're recognizing this patient as having HHS, or the hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. So on the same day, you have two patients paint, uh, presenting with emergencies of having high blood sugar. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this video. The emergency department presentations of hyperglycemia, namely DKA and HHS. So a good place to start would be with glucose metabolism. So let's talk about it. Let's say you eat something and we're healthy, so we're going to eat an apple. And the complex sugars in here are eventually going to be broken down into some of our simpler sugars, like glucose. And what this is going to do is it's going to stimulate the pancreas to release insulin. Now, insulin comes from the beta cells of the islets or islets of Langerhans in the pancreas and so this insulin then gets released and it's going to go have its effect on the liver and on muscle and what this will do to the liver if we go over here we can take a blow up the liver here it what's going to happen is the glucose is going to go into the liver and it's going to be stored as glycogen uh, and this glycogen can then be broken down and re released again later in response to other hormones these are the counter regulatory hormones like glucagon cortisol growth hormone and epinephrine right if you look at these hormones these hormones uh, are going to be times that you need energy right whenever you're growing you need energy if you're stressed out or you have your fight and flight refl uh, response you're going to need energy so whatever you have these energy these hormones floating around it's going to release the energy but insulin uh, is the good time hormone where things are going fine you got some food you need to store it gets stored into the muscle and into the liver and in the liver it can then be released again into the bloodstream the only difference in the muscle is it will go into the muscle as well it'll be get stored as glycogen and used as needed but the muscle doesn't ever release it outside because it needs to keep it it's the motor of the body and so that's basically how our metabolism for glucose works so what happens in diabetes well let's take a look for diabetes type 1 what happens is that you're just not making insulin and so there's uh, no insulin being released. What happens? It's an autoimmune thing, and so you have T cells attacking the beta cells in the islets of longer hands, and so now you don't have insulin being made. There may also be some counter regulatory hormones that are not being released, and so it, type 1 diabetes is a problem of not having enough insulin. Now, type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, is a problem of the body not responding to the insulin. So it's insulin insensitivity or insulin resistance. And this is probably due to bad insulin receptors or the response to insulin just really isn't that strong. So type 2 diabetes really is not a problem of not enough insulin. Just the insulin we have, the body's not responding to it. Now, gestational diabetes, which is a, which happens during pregnancy, is oftentimes just a mix of the two. So you don't have enough insulin, and the insulin you have 
is uh, not as effective. And so the treatment for these is going to be pretty obvious given the cause. If you don't have enough insulin, you need to give insulin. And in the case of type 2 diabetes, you need to make the body uh, take up the insulin more, be more sensitive, sensitive to it, so you give the oral hypoglycemic drugs, which are going to increase insulin sensitivity. And now we're going to look at the two presentations of, of, of high blood sugar that we're going to see in the emergency department. We already took a quick peek at it. This is diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state. This name tends to change through the years. We used to call it honk, hyperosmolar non-ketotic non -ketotic state. Uh, I like honk better than HHS because you get to say honk. But let's take a look, really, at both of them. So the diabetic ketoacidosis tends to be a younger patient, but it doesn't have to be. Oftentimes, it's the first onset of, the, uh, of diabetes when you discover it. They present with belly pain, and this is because of ketones. The ketones cause them to have belly pain. And uh, they tend to be very acidotic. And they also get this fruity smell. The fruity smell is also from the ketones, and the acidosis is from the ketones. So these ketones make a huge difference. The sugars are usually uh, around like 200, 300, 400, and their uh, pH is usually low as well, maybe around 7.3, or it could be as low as 6.9. It could be pretty darn low. Now, let's contrast that with HHS. HHS tends to be older patients with other medical problems, whereas this thing is pretty fast onset, the DKA, the HHS tends to gradually get worse and worse over some time until they finally become obtunded. And then, uh, it, and then they present to the emergency department. So the distinguishing feature here is the ketosis in DKA. And DKA is not the only thing that can cause ketosis. Alcoholic ketosis and starvation ketosis can cause it as well. But in DKA, it, it comes from the, uh, the diabetes. Now, what happens in DKA? Well, usually something causes a big spike in the sugar, and it can be that they are non-compliant on their medications, or maybe they have an infection or some other stressor and what that causes is an increase in those counter-regulatory hormones and ultimately what this causes is uh, the inability for sugar to get into the cells because there is no insulin right and so with no sugar in the cells then these cells need to start to rely on mobilizing their fat for energy. So we get fat metabolism. And this fat metabolism is the ketogenesis that we see. The fat, it gets uh, broken down into our ketone bodies that we know and love, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now both of these are acids. Uh, the one that predominates, the ones that we see the most often, is the beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, what we used to do commonly is to check a urine dipstick. So here's a urine sample with a urine dipstick in it. And the dipstick would be positive only for uh, acetoacetate, not for beta-hydroxybutyrate. So if this is the one we see mostly, that's not what we're picking up. We're only going to pick up the acetoacetate in the urine dipstick. Now, as I said, they're both acids, so this is responsible for the acidosis, the profound acidosis that we see. It's also responsible for that fruity smell that we get from DKA. Uh, the ketones are also responsible for the metabolic acidosis, which causes the belly pain that we see in the kids. So now you got a lot of ketones floating around in the blood, and you also got a lot of sugar floating around. Now the sugar is going to get to the kidneys eventually and it just overwhelms the proximal tubules. There's no way that it can reabsorb all that sugar. So that's how you get that osmotic diuresis which then leads to dehydration which then leads to shock. Now the shock can eventually be bad enough to actually kill. It could be fatal in about 5% of the cases but uh, it tends to present pretty dramatically and so you're able to catch it and uh, deal with it. So this is really what we're seeing happening with DKA. 
All right, so now let's look at HHS. Now, HHS, we said, tends to happen on older people, slowly progressing until eventually they become abundant and they go from walking to comatose. And the cause here is usually going to be some sort of stressor, uh, something like an infection or an MI. Those are the two most common causes I've seen. But it could be strokes, it could be non-compliance, it could also be drugs. And it's worth looking at the drugs that could do it. It could be beta blockers, birth control pills, steroids, antipsychotic medicines, um, phenytoin, that says phenobarbital, it's actually phenytoin, and hydrochlorothiazide, so thiazide diuretics. There, so I made it say phenytoin now. And so it could be drugs, it could be st all of these stressors could then lead to uh, to the problem. So the way I postulate it works, but I don't know that I've read this anywhere, is that you get this increased stress, and so now you have an increase of the counter-regulatory hormones. And those things work against insulin. So whatever insulin that was there before, the body was already not responding to that well because it was resistant to it. And now it's extra not responding to it. And so what happens? The sugars go up and up and up. And up, and you can see the sugars can be in excess of 600 to 1,000 or more. I think we had a case a couple of weeks ago where a patient had a sugar of over 2,000, which is crazy high. And that sugar is an osmotically active thing, and so the serum osmoles, which is usually around 200 or so, uh, 270, 280, somewhere around there, is going to be greater than 320 millimoles per liter. And so, what happens here? is you're going to have an osmotic diuresis again, so they're going to become slowly more and more uh, hypotensive and dehydrated because they're peeing out all their fluid, because they're peeing out all the sugar. But what they don't have is a ketosis because there is still insulin floating around, and that insulin is enough to prevent fat metabolism. So that's a big deal because that means there's no ketosis. And without ketosis, you don't have all those other things that were happening. You don't have the acidosis. You don't have the belly pain. You don't have that profound drop in the pH. And so these are really the distinguishing features of HHS, is that it tends to be slower in onset, less obvious. And it's usually in the old demented patients. But they're going to end up, because it's been going on over more time, more dehydrated on their presentation. And because these older guys tend to be sicker and they have usually a worse cause for it, they also have a higher mortality, around 33%. So this was our introductory video to uh, the hyperglycemic uh, presentations in the emergency department, namely DKA and HHS. We'll go over more in the next video. All right, I'll see you there.